Good morning. Welcome to those in the room and welcome to those worshiping with us online to worship at the St. John United Church of Christ in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we are glad to have you worship with us on a beautiful Sunday morning, rather cold, but uh, a beautiful Sunday morning, the last Sunday of the liturgical year. Uh, this is what we call the Reign of Christ Sunday. We, we begin our year in Advent with the preparing for and then welcoming the coming of Christ into the world and going through his life and death and resurrection and then through what, what we call ordinary time, just exploring the, the depths of, of his teaching and his life. But then we come to this Sunday, uh, which is the culmination, reminding us that, that, that Christ is the head of the church, uh, the, head of, the head of the body. Whatever has been happening in your life this week, whether you have felt like you were living in the reign of Christ or not, we're glad that you are here. And I just invite you to, you know, thinking about this being not only the reign of Christ Sunday, but also the Sunday before our celebration of the Thanksgiving holiday, when we are reminded that we should really be aware of all for which we have to be thankful. And I just invite you maybe as, as Nicholas plays our prelude this morning to, to contemplate that for, for a few minutes. How are you blessed? What do you have to be thankful for? Beyond just the usual, you know, family, food, house, go deeper. What is there in your life? How are the ways that God has blessed and, and is blessing you? Let's contemplate that as we begin our time of worship together. Let's worship. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. Christ is the image of the invisible God. In Christ, all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. In Christ, all things in heaven and on earth were created. Christ reigns over thrones and dominions and rulers and powers. Christ is the head of the body, the church. Through Christ, all things are reconciled to God, making peace by his love on the cross. This is the love we adore, the love we worship, the love we serve. Alleluia. Pray with me, please. God of majesty and mercy, we give you thanks and praise 
for your commitment to your creation, including us. In Christ, you've turned the world upside down, revealing your strength through weakness and your power through compassion. In the cross of Christ, you taught us that no hopeless situation or frightening possibility is beyond your reach. We praise you for your love at work around us and within us, always able to do more than we can ask or even imagine. Receive our love and our worship this day, our sovereign and our Savior. Amen. I invite you to stand in body or spirit and join us as we sing together our hymn of praise. may be seated. I invite you to join me in our time of confession. We'll offer together the prayer of confession printed in your order of worship. We'll follow that with a time for silent prayer or just the keeping of silence. Let's pray together. In these moments, remembering God, we bring to you all the ways we have not lived as your people. We stand by watching while those in need struggle to survive. We cast our lots with those who worship power and success. We offer insults rather than words of grace to those who care for us. We scoff at your words which call us to a different lifestyle. Forgive us, God of mercy, for not knowing what we do to you, to others, to ourselves. Speak to us through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and our savior, who bears words filled with your tender mercy and gracious hope. Even when we cling to the things that unnecessarily separate us, God unscatters us. No matter who we are or what has brought us to this very moment, God chooses to love us back to wholeness, individually and communally. Friends, we are God's forgiven people. 
Thanks be to God. You stand in body or in spirit for the reading of our scripture lesson. And by the might of God's glory, you'll be endowed with the strength needed to stand fast and endure joyfully whatever may happen. Thanks be to God for having made you worthy to share in the inheritance of the Holy Ones in light. God rescued us from the authority of darkness and brought us into the reign of Jesus, God's only begotten. And it is through Jesus that we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Christ is the image of the unseen God and the firstborn of all creation. For in Christ we were, crea were created all things in heaven and on earth, everything visible and invisible, thrones, dominion, do dominations, sovereignties, powers, all things were created through Christ and for Christ. Before anything was created, Christ existed, and all things hold together in Christ. The church is the body, Christ is its head. Christ is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and so Christ is first in every way. God wanted all perfection to be found in Christ, and all things to be reconciled to God through Christ. Everything in heaven and everything on earth. When Christ made peace by dying on the cross. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy One, thank you for these moments when we can gather, gather physically perhaps, but also gather in spirit to remind ourselves of your presence, of your love, and of your call to us to follow you. In these moments, help us to hear the message that you have for us perhaps by words spoken aloud and even more by the still small whisper of your spirit. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Did you know that recently they changed the words to the national anthem of Great Britain? amazing, isn't it? You can change words. Well, actually, they only changed one word. For over 70 years, they had been singing God Save the Queen. But upon the death of Elizabeth II, her son Charles succeeded her on the British throne, and so immediately the song became God Save the King. In this country, we, we have a fascination with royalty, but in reality we're pretty removed from the whole concept. The founders of the nation were intentional about forming a government where no one person would wield that kind of power. Their experience with the kings of England had not exactly been positive, and so they were intentional about that. And despite the rise of authoritarianism in the world and, quite frankly, here in recent years, I think most of us are still wary of that much power for one person. We remember the quote from the 19th century British historian Lord Acton, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So then, what do we make of this day in the liturgical calendar? We call it Reign of Christ Sunday, but it began, and some still refer to it as Christ the King Sunday. It's a relatively recent addition to the liturgical calendar, begun less than 100 years ago by Pope Pius XI in 1925. And he, he did it to remind the people of the church that, that our ultimate allegiance is to Christ rather than earthly rulers, which is good. 
But Jesus repeatedly rejected being king. You may remember after his baptism, as he was about to begin his ministry, he went through a, a time of temptation. The last of those temptations was when he was taken up on a high mountain and the scripture says that he was shown the kingdoms of the world and offered the opportunity to rule them all. He rejected the idea, walked away. In the Gospel of John's telling of Jesus' miraculous feeding of, it says 5,000 men, but he figured there were probably a few women and children there too. So miraculous feeding of thousands of people that, as John tells it, the, the people were amazed and, and excited by, by this incredible miracle, by what Jesus had done. And, and they were saying that, that he was the one that they had been hoping for and that they had been waiting for, which by the way, was a political messiah, one who would come and overthrow their Roman oppressors. But John says Jesus knew that they were going to try to make him king by force. So he walked away. And then later when he was on trial before Pilate, Pilate asked him if he was a king and in this case, he actually said yes, but he went on to say, my kingdom's not of this place. My kingdom's not of, of this world. If it were, I could have called upon my servants, presumably referring to the angels. I could have called upon them, and they would have prevented me from even being arrested. My kingdom's it's not of here. But people have and still insist on him being that kind of king. Now, for the first three centuries, the church wasn't like that, wasn't about that. In those times, if you became a Christian, if you joined the church, you were joining a group that was in opposition to the empire. And you knew by doing so that there was a good chance that you would be persecuted, perhaps even killed for your allegiance to your association with that body. And so you were committing to following the way of Christ, which meant doing the things that Jesus did, helping people, lifting up the poor, working for justice for everybody, not just the powerful and elite. That was the first three centuries. But then the fourth century saw the birth of what came to be referred to as Christendom. Roman Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the empire. So on the surface, sounds good. You know, Christians, no more persecution. Yay! But it's true. They were no longer the ones persecuted. They were the ones with power. Which ultimately led, in too many instances, to the church being the ones doing the persecuting. Led to things like the doctrine of discovery, led to things like the practice of colonization and the stealing of land and lives. That's not what Jesus taught. It's not what Jesus lived and died for. And yet we have folks in this country today claiming that the country was founded as a quote-unquote Christian nation and seeking to make it their idea of one now. Well, first of all, it wasn't. And secondly, 
that's simply not in line with what Jesus taught and lived. When given the chance, he again and again and again rejected political power, rejected being king. See, Jesus didn't come to establish an empire. He came to start a movement. He rejected the kind of power that comes with empire. That kind of power is coercive. It is enforced. And it is all too often violent. But sadly, there are many who view God that way. Just as an example, the, the very idea of or, or theory of substitutionary atonement says that God required the sacrifice of Jesus in order to satisfy God's sense of justice. And the majority of churches teach this as orthodoxy, as something that you have to believe in order to become a Christian. In his book, The Universal Christ, Richard Rohr writes, at best, the theory of substitutionary atonement has inoculated us against the true effects of the gospel, causing us to largely thank Jesus instead of honestly imitating him. At worst, it led us to see God as a cold, brutal figure who demands acts of violence before God can love God's own creation. Now, this might be how an authoritarian king would act. But it isn't what Jesus taught or how Jesus lived. He taught and demonstrated love and mercy Grace and forgiveness, generosity, and a justice that lifts up everyone, not just the privileged, the powerful, and the wealthy. That's how he lived, and he invited people to follow him in that way of living. It was a movement of people who heard the good news that God loved them and was with them and they chose to live life in that knowledge and from that place of abundance. UCC pastor Martha Spong tells a story. She writes, My daughter was 11 when I moved from my first ministry call to an interim position. The first time she saw the new church's sanctuary, she turned to me puzzled. Who is that? she asked. We stood and looked together at the stained glass image of Christ above the altar, crowned and holding an orb and scepter, his feet on a tiny flower-shaped cloud, implying an existence beyond this world. Coming from a church where one stained glass window portrayed Jesus holding a lamb, while the other pictured him sitting on a rock surrounded by little children, she held a more down-to-earth view. He seemed to her like a kind teacher, a good shepherd, someone less shiny and more accessible than a king above the world. Over the years, you may have noticed that I occasionally use the word kingdom rather than the word kingdom. We generally take the word kin to mean people to whom we are related. Family. Think of the phrase next of kin or the word kinfolk. Kingdom. Doesn't that give a much better, more accurate portrayal of what the church is meant to be and of what the reign of Christ is? Much more about family and relationship than about 
royalty and power. Under the reign of Christ, we live in the kingdom more than in what we traditionally associate with a kingdom. Now, before you get too nervous, I'm not going to ask you to change everything. There are some things, it's okay. If the scriptures use the word kingdom, then that's what we'll read. And when we pray the prayer of our Savior here in just a few minutes, we'll pray, thy kingdom come. But we'll understand that what we're talking about and what Christ came to establish was not an empire, was not a Christian nation, not a kingdom, but a kingdom for us all. Amen. Please stand in body or in spirit and join me in our affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us, we are not alone. Thanks be to God. we come to our time of prayer in this morning's service, as always, I encourage you to, to offer up the prayers of your heart, even as I lead us in prayer, and then to join me as together we voice the prayer of our Savior. Before we begin this morning, I want to share just a couple of things. First of all, um, we received word uh, just in recent days of the passing of of one who has been a member of this church for a number of years, has not attended in recent years, but Elizabeth Katzman uh, passed away recently. And so we, we remember her family and loved ones uh, in this time. And I would also encourage us to be in prayer for family and friends of those affected by the shooting last night in Colorado Springs, Colorado, at at the Club Q, LGBTQ club, nightclub. Along with being the reign of Christ Sunday and the Sunday before Thanksgiving, I, I didn't know until I happened to see online this morning that today is also apparently Transgender Remembrance Day. And so as we think about that shooting last night, we're reminded of the need for a transgender remembrance day. Whatever is on your heart this morning, I invite you to lift up those concerns or those, those thanksgivings and praises also. For God hears each and every one. Let's pray. Oh Christ, we give you thanks that you reign through love as the power that embraces the world with mercy and hope. Thank you for revealing that to trust is wisdom, that to forgive is the best way to deal with enemies, and that to serve is the best way to lead. We pray that through the grace of your kingdom, each beloved creature and person will know safety and satisfaction in their own homes. Let the vision of your peaceable kingdom take root in our hearts, bringing healing to families and communities and in every place wounded by violence or destruction. 
Oh Christ, we give you thanks for reaching out to those on the margins and those others shunned so that each one knew they belonged in your kingdom. We pray for those who face discrimination or insecurity in our communities, who long simply for respect and a chance to thrive. Teach us how to live differently as neighbors, to acknowledge and work with others we've never worked with before. Lead us by your spirit to share in your work of mending the world. O oh Christ, thank you for enduring the pain of the cross and the darkness of the tomb to show us that there is life beyond death through your resurrecting love. We pray for those who are grieving a loss this day, the loss of someone beloved, the loss of love or hope or trust, the loss of opportunity or security or future plans. Be present with all who have experienced the sadness and disruption of a loss and bring each one comfort and courage. O oh Christ, this day we pray for your church at work in the world, confronting the challenges and changes of these times. Unite us in witness and in service and encourage us when difficulties arise, for we are your people committed to the unfolding of your reign among us as we pray the words that you taught us to pray. O oh God, our mother, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Living in the kingdom of God, living into the reign of Christ, we're faced with an opportunity to participate in God's restorative action in the world. Where others have scattered, God is gathering. Let us be empowered to share our gifts fruitfully and allow God to multiply them for the good of all. For all who wish to give, offering plates are located at the exits of the sanctuary. You're invited to leave your gifts there after the service. Alternative methods of giving include checks sent by mail, setting up automatic giving through your financial institution, or using the Venmo app on your smartphone. Just search for St. John United Church of Christ, Louisville. May God bless and abundantly use all the gifts of God's people.
as we think about the concept of the kingdom, when we think about family, we think about where families gather. Yesterday, Lisa and I had all of our kids and their significant others at our house for our family Thanksgiving. And a lot of the day we were kind of here and there around the house. But when we came together around the table, that was the special time. Not just because of the food, but just by being able to look around that table and see these people that you love and sharing that time and that space and that, that meal with them. I am thankful this day to be able to share this table with you, the table of Christ, where all are welcome. And so hear these words. This is the table, not of the Lord. It is not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love God and who want to love God more. So come, you who have much faith, you who have little, you who have been here often, and you who have not been here for a long time, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come, not because I invited you. The invitation comes from God. It is God's will and God's joy that those who seek Christ should meet Christ here. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he sat at supper with his disciples. While they were eating, he took a piece of bread, said a blessing, broke it, and gave it to them with these words. And later, he took the cup, saying, And so now, following Jesus' example and command, we take this bread and this cup, the ordinary things of the world that Christ makes holy. Come. For all is ready.
I invite you, in body or in spirit, to stand and join us in our prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, merciful God, for gladness in this bread and cup, for love that cannot die, for peace the world cannot give, for joy in the company of friends, for the splendors of creation, and for the mission of justice you have made our own. Give us the gifts of this Holy Communion, oneness of heart, love for neighbors, forgiveness of enemies, the will to serve you every day, and life that never ends. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Let me take just a moment to highlight some announcements. Uh, first of all, I hope you will stay with us for uh, a few minutes uh, for some refreshment and fellowship in the back of the sanctuary. We've been doing this after worship in the narthex, but as you may have noticed, it's a little chilly today. And so we uh, are moving that inside and it'll be in the rear of the sanctuary, some, some nice warm apple cider. And I'm not sure, do we have cookies today too? Oh, we have cookies to do. You can't pass that up. Apple cider and cookies. So hope you'll stay and, and share in that time with us. And then all are invited to stick around after worship. Uh, you may, I, I mentioned earlier that this is the, the last Sunday of the liturgical year. That means next Sunday is the first Sunday of the new year. And that means it is the first Sunday of Advent. And so we are going to hang around after worship today and begin the process of adorning, <clears throat> excuse me, adorning the sanctuary for the Advent and Christmas season. Uh, there's quite a lot to do, but we have a good time doing it. So I hope that you can, can stick around and help with that. It would be much appreciated. Also, uh, with that in mind, we are getting ready to order poinsettias that will be placed in the sanctuary a little later in Advent uh, for the season. And if you would like to, to donate uh, at one or more poinsettias, you are welcome to do that. There's an insert in your bulletin that's an order form to do that. But today's the deadline. We've got to order them this week. Uh, so we need to know today who would like to, to do so. And then one other thing I want to mention that's not in your bulletin, that, which is that two weeks from today, December 4th, right after worship, we will hold our fall congregational meeting. Uh, the primary uh, actions that uh, need to take place at that time are uh, the uh, approval of a budget for 2023 and the election of new members to serve on our church council. And I will mention, I think we've got some people maybe who have agreed to serve, but uh, if that's something that you've thought about and nobody has ever asked you if you would like to serve, let us know, please. Uh, we would be glad to talk with you about that. So that's December 4th, right after worship. And it probably will not be a very long meeting. As I say, those are, are the two things to, to be dealt with, just the approval of a budget. And that budget will be published ahead of time. We'll get it to you so that you won't just have to look at it in five minutes and approve it that day. We'll get it out uh, in the next week or so, so that you'll have time to, to review it. So doing that, uh, electing new council members, and, uh, and that's it. So any other announcements that need to be made today that I have overlooked? All right, well, it's been good to worship with you today. And I hope that you have a, a blessed rest of the day and have a, have a blessed Thanksgiving this week. If you are traveling, I, I pray that you will have safety and, and uh, just enjoy that time with family, with loved ones. But at this time, let's stand together as we sing our closing hymn. <laughs>
Friends, we are living in God's kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of love and mercy and grace and justice. So go and follow Christ. Don't just thank him. Don't just worship him, but follow. Go and be the church. In the name of God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, amen.